Hello and welcome. This is Will Rems for Create the Learning Site, a place to go deeper in your understanding of the Bible. Here we go. I'm making a change this month with a new camera. This means that you'll see me on the screen more in this and future recordings. Uh, this issue is a standalone on Canaanite religion in the Bible, but it does lay the groundwork for what I want to cover next, which is Canaanite mythology in the Bible, uh, among which especially the Divine Council. So, various gods and goddesses of Canaan make their appearance in the Bible, uh, and it's easy to get confused. In Judges 2 verse 13, for instance, we read that the Israelites abandoned the Lord and served the Baals, and the Ashtarot, here marked in blue. Now, let's jump to Judges 3 verse 7, and we read something similar. The Israelites forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals, and the Asherot. Now, Astarot and Asherot, what's the difference? Now, when it comes to the gods and goddesses of Canaan, we would not have all that much to go by if it were not for the fortunate discovery of a significant library of clay tablets at Ugarit. Ugarit is located to the north of Lebanon, in today's Syria, marked uh, with red on this map on the right. And strictly speaking, it's therefore not part of Canaan proper. Uh, nevertheless, the language, Ukaritic, is closely related to various Canaanite dialects, and the culture appears to have been similar as well. It is assumed that the mythology reflected in these Ukaritic texts that have been excavated closely resembles that of Canaan. Much is still unclear, and new discoveries or insights may make corrections necessary, uh, but here's a reconstruction. At the top of the Canaanite pantheon stands El. The word El simply means God, but it is also used as a personal name. And El is portrayed as wise and old. He is the uh, progenitor, the father of the gods and the creator of the world. And one of his titles, interestingly, is Bull El. Images of bulls and calves have been found in Canaan associated with either El or Baal, and it may have been understood as a pedestal for the invisible presence of the god standing on this bull, uh, and rather than a, a representation of the god himself. El's consort is Asherah, a mother goddess, uh, who gave birth to 70 sons, among them uh, Baal. Uh, these gods form uh, a divine council uh, under the leadership of El or Baal, uh, and they run the world. Uh, then there is also the goddess Astarte, uh, in Hebrew Astoret, widely worshipped in the ancient Near East, not only in Canaan, uh, she was the goddess of fertility, sexuality, and probably war, widely worshipped uh, as the Queen of Heaven. Uh, as such, she also appears in the book of Jeremiah. Now, the problem is, uh, in some texts she is clearly distinct from Asherah, but there's also some inconsistency, some confusion. Uh, it may be that at different times uh, the two goddesses were merged into one. Uh, something similar uh, is true about Dagon or Dagan. Uh, he appears as a, a Philistine god, the god of the Philistines in 1 Samuel, uh, but in origin he's a Canaanite deity, uh, and at times he is distinguished from El, and, and yet at the same time both Dagon and El can be referred to as the father of Baal, so there, 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 there may have been uh, merging going on there as well, or not quite clear. Now, Baal, uh, or Hadad, was the god of storm, uh, the weather, lightning, rain, which makes him very important in the Mediterranean climate, uh, where the winter rains 
are vital to agriculture, but not reliable. Baal is often portrayed holding a club and a lightning rod, uh, as on the left, and the statuette on the right uh, actually suggests he is holding these items uh, by its pose. It was Baal rather than El who led the Council of the Gods and effectively ruled the world. Asherah may be so closely associated with Baal that she may at times have been considered his consort rather than else. And then Hadad also appears as storm god, in principle distinguished from Baal, but at times, as in the Baal cycle that I will talk about a little later, equated with him. And maybe that Baal was originally a title meaning Lord and later developed into a personal name. Or perhaps Baal and Hadad were gods in different territories and were later discerned to be the same, known by two different names. After all, they do represent the same forces of nature. In the first millennium BC, Hadad had become the national deity of Syria and his most prominent appearance in the Old Testament is in the name of kings and others from that area. For instance, Ben-Hadad, literally son of Hadad, king of Syria, uh, mentioned in uh, the Book of Kings. His name also appears in Zechariah 12 verse 11, where reference is made to the mourning for Hadad Rimon, presumably a fertility ritual at the end of summer when the rain-bringing storm god appeared to have died and needed to be brought back. More about this story later. And then we have uh, Anad, who is Baal's sister. She's called a virgin. She's a goddess of war and perhaps of love, although that's in doubt. Uh, and she has um, a volatile and violent temper. The Baal cycle describes her as, uh, in a battle, uh, as knee deep and neck deep in the blood and gore of warriors, uh, and that is something she enjoys very much. Now, except as part of geographical names, Anat uh, does not appear in the Old Testament, but she does play a crucial role in the Baal cycles. Uh, the, uh, we'll talk about, uh, as do the next two deities. First, there is Mot, the god of the underworld and of death, although it may be more accurate to say he is death, and his appetite for human flesh is unsatiable. Isaiah's statement in chapter 25 that God will swallow up death forever really is a pun on Mot's nature. Uh, and then there is Yam, the god of the sea. Uh, seeing that the sea has fearsome destructive power, uh, it was perceived and personified as an unpredictable, even evil force of chaos. And associated with uh, Yam in some way is Lotan, Lotan, uh, the Canaanite na name for Leviathan in the Hebrew Bible. A seven-headed serpent or sea monster, dragon-like, killed in battle by either Anat or Baal. And then uh, <clears throat> I only mention very briefly Molech or Milcom, the god of the Ammonites, often linked with child sacrifice, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites. And now we come to the Baal cycle that was found in Ukarit. You see part of the text here. Uh, it consists of three parts. Part one describes the battle between Yam, the sea, and Baal. Part two is when Baal builds his palace on Mount Saphon. And part three is about the conflict between Baal and Mot, the god of death. Many portions of the text are damaged or missing altogether, as you can tell from this illustration. Uh, but in what follows, uh, I'll, I'll give a tentative reconstruction of the storyline. Part 1. The battle with Yam. The first conflict is triggered when El decides, 
or perhaps is forced by Yam to appoint Yam as king over the gods. For this, Yam will have to defeat Baal and seize his throne. Yam is a formidable opponent with powerful allies, sea monsters like Leviathan, but Baal defeats him with the help of a magic club he has been given. Uh, as we have seen, Baal is often portrayed holding a club ready to strike. Battles like this between Cosmos, the ordered world, and personified chaos, non-order, represented by the sea, are a common motif in creation myths of the ancient Near East. A Canaanite mythology, however, uh, there does not appear to be a link with creation. Baal's victory guarantees the continued order and stability of the, of the earth. Then part two, building the palace. The second part begins with a gruesome battle scene involving Anad, Baal's sister, reveling in the blood and gore of the slaughter. Afterwards, Baal complains to her that he doesn't have a palace. That's not a small thing. Baal's kingship is not secure and does not appear legitimate without one. What kind of a king does not have a palace? So first Anad and then Ashera plead with El to permit this, let Baal have his palace. The palace is built and the story, the climax of the story is Baal enthroned in his house, reigning over the gods and preparing a feast. He invites Mot to this feast, which may be an implicit call to submit to Baal's rule and acknowledge his kingship. And so we come to part three, the conflict with Mot. It appears that Mot has taken offense. He threatens to eat Baal. Baal is in dread and agrees to surrender to Mot. He enters the underworld, Mot's domain. With Baal's death, the land dries out and vegetation withers. After some time has passed, Anat attacks Mot, cuts him into pieces, winnows him, grinds him, burns him, scatters the remains of the earth, feeding them to the birds, and Baal returns, rain and fertility are restored. After seven years more, Mot also comes back to life and revives the conflict. The two fight to exhaustion, but without uh, resolution, and then Mot hears that El has changed his mind, uh, now supports Baal as king and is threatening to take Mot's throne over the underworld away. And upon this, Mot acknowledges Baal as king and withdraws to his own realm, the underworld. Uh, peace and harmony, order are restored. There is debate about what this myth represents. Many believe that it establishes or mirrors the seasonal pattern. In the dry summer half of the year, Mot takes over and Baal is dead. He has to be revived or released from the underworld for rain and fertility to return at the end of summer. Others argue that the myth seeks to explain catastrophic seasons of drought, a period of several years in which little or no rain falls. Uh, we know this from uh, the Joseph narrative in Genesis, from Elijah's days in the book of Kings. Ironically, there it is Yahweh who controls the rain and fertility, not Baal. In the Hebrew Bible, Baal, Asherah and Astoreth often appear in the plural. Baalim, Asherot or Asherim, surprisingly, a masculine plural for the name of a female deity, and Astaroth. In addition, the name Baal can appear with a location added, for instance, Baal of Peor or Hadad Rimon in Zechariah 12. This does not imply that there were multiple Baals and Asherot. It refers to a local manifestation or local cult of the respective god or goddess. Asherah is at the same time also used for an object, an object that could be cut down and burned with fire since that's what the law prescribes that should be done with the Asherot or Asherim uh, in the land, it must therefore be of wood so that it can burn. The object probably represented Asherah in some way, not unlike an image, uh, and it had a function in the cult, but we do not know any specifics. It's often assumed to be an Asherah pole or a holy tree or perhaps even a grove. 
That's how the King James Bible translated the word grove for Asherah, as did the Septuagint, uh, the ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so uh, from the time of Judges onwards, Canaanite gods and religion made inroads into Israel. The heyday of Baal worship in Israel came in the days of Elijah, when the Phoenician princess Jezebel launched a massive campaign to promote Baal in Israel. But perhaps even more treacherous than this was a parallel development, mixing the worship of Yahweh and Baal. In popular and syncretistic religion in Israel, Yahweh could be equated with either El or Baal. And that had consequences. As we can see here, uh, it's a reconstruction of a jar, the remnants of a jar that were found in the northern Sinai and that probably date back to the 8th century BC. Uh, it was found in the immediate vicinity of inscriptions speaking of Yahweh of Samaria and his Asherah, or Yahweh of Timon and his Asherah. And so presumably we're looking at Yahweh, here portrayed like El with the head of a bull, accompanied by his Asherah or his wife. In addition, hundreds of statuettes, like this one here, have been excavated in Israel. They're known as pillar figurines because of their pillar-like base. They show a female holding her breasts. She must represent either Asherah or Astoreth, or perhaps both, merged into one. But otherwise, the meaning is unclear. What is she offering? Is it nurture of some kind, symbolized by breastfeeding? Or is it fertility? Or is it sex? Without any textual reference, uh, it is hard to know. And so we come to recent debates regarding Canaanite religion. Traditionally, it has been held that the Canaanites were exceptionally depraved, especially in sexual practices, that they performed child sacrifice, and that the worship of Baal involved ritual prostitution. Nowadays, this is often challenged. So, were the Canaanites particularly depraved people? Well, let's be cautious. We know relatively little about the actual practice of religion in Canaan, especially among the common people. Uh, we probably should not exaggerate Canaanite depravity. It needs to be kept in mind that the aim of scripture in this context is to warn Israel for certain actions and their consequences. Its focus is therefore on the negative, describing it in strong language. In doing this, it's not wrong or untrue, it is deliberately one-sided. Not everything Canaanite is always bad. Solomon needed Hiram's help, king of uh, Tyre, to build the temple. And Elijah found refuge with a widow in the vicinity of Sidon. Still, uh, child sacrifice and cult prostitution are morally reprehensible to the extent that these were practiced by the Canaanites, their culture would be reprehensible as well. But did they practice child sacrifice? The phrase used in the Old Testament literally means to make your children pass through the fire. Some interpret this as a dedication ritual. The child was not actually burned. Well, this appears unlikely. The context of the phrase frequently implies more and the horror and moral outrage of the law and the prophets when they speak of it suggests something a lot less innocent. But even if the Israelites engaged in uh, child sacrifice, did the Canaanites? In those Old Testament passages where a deity is mentioned, uh, it's usually Molech, the god of the Ammonites. There are exceptions, however. Uh, in Deuteronomy, twice it speaks of child sacrifice as a Canaanite practice. According to Jeremiah 19, children were sacrificed to Baal on the high places built for him. Now, again, we know little about Canaanite practice, especially early practice. 
But later Greek and Latin sources are clear and shocked. In antiquity, the Phoenicians, that's the Canaanites from the Lebanese coast and their widespread colonies around the Mediterranean, were notorious for this practice. And so it might be possible to find alternative explanations for all this evidence, but I'm not convinced. Where else did the Israelites and the Ammonites get the idea? So what about cult prostitution? Because he was the storm god bringing the rain, Baal played an important role for the fertility of the land. We have seen that Baal had to be released from the realm of the dead for rain and fertility to be restored to the earth. In this context, prostitution may have been understood as a magical act, act or a symbolic enactment meant to induce the fruitfulness of the land, as if sexual acts performed in Baal's temple would uh, boost his power and his ability to make the land fertile. Such an explanation is widely questioned today. However, uh, it hasn't been disproven. There are really two questions at stake. Was there sacred prostitution or at least sexual immorality as part of the cult? And then the second question, if yes, what did it mean? Despite the modern debate questioning it, the Old Testament seems clear that sexual immorality was strongly associated with Baal worship. There's even a separate term distinct from ordinary prostitutes, the female form of a Hebrew word derived from the adjective holy, therefore presumably meaning holy or cult prostitute. It will not work to argue that this term simply means consecrated woman and therefore priestess. Compare, for instance, how in Genesis 38, both terms are used to describe Tamar uh, seducing her father-in-law, Judah. No one mistook her for a priestess. She posed as a prostitute. And then also, for instance, Hosea 4, verse 14, their prostitute and the word for cult prostitute are used in synonymous parallelism, uh, suggesting that we, uh, she was she was not or not just a priestess but engaged in a sexual act. Now oh, there, there's other uh, passages that come into this. The meaning of this, well that, that's more difficult. People back then knew what it meant and so it was not explained. Regardless of whether the explanation of magic fertility ritual is correct or not, the high places and Baal worship in Israel clearly were associated with sexual immorality in the Old Testament. Mixing sex and religion makes for a potent and seductive brew. Eugene Peterson captures this well in his Bible translation, The Message. Now, when it comes to the high places where the people of Israel worshipped, uh, he speaks of sex and religion shrines. It should now be clear what happened to the Israelites once they settled among the Canaanites. They were Canaanized. They reconceptualized Yahweh in the image of Baal. Worship forms were adjusted accordingly. The result was syncretism, and this is where it gets practical. We, too, are in danger of getting infected with the values and beliefs of the culture that surrounds us. Daniel Block, in the New American Commentary on Judges, points to our preoccupation with prosperity, for instance, uh, which, he claims, turns Christianity into a fertility religion. And he also points to our eagerness to fight the Lord's battles with the world's resources and strategies. Canaanization also happens when we embrace political or national agendas as an essential part of our faith. It leads to syncretism and cultural Christianity, the Christian right or the Christian left. This happened in pre-war Germany 
to the Catholic Church in Francos, Spain, to the Roman Church under Constantine and in Byzantium, but it's always much easier to see it happen to others in a different part of the world or in the past. So maybe rather than point the finger at those other cases, each of us should ask, how am I unduly buying into the idols and the ideological or political agenda of my age and my culture? That's a much harder question to answer. Thank you.